Hello everyone, um, this is like a, a special guest appearance version of Feminist Heretics where we've basically like um, stolen Lier from the Women's Declaration International. They did a webinar recently um, where Lier and Marion talked about Andrew Dawkins' book Scapegoat. Amazing, I've just got a photocopy here so I won't hold it up. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm the same. We both thought it was like a great webinar. There was keeps we wanted to talk more about, um, and so we've both kind of since then read the book. And yeah, we're just hoping to get into some more detail and discussion with Leah today. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Kate. Okay, uh, so I wasn't I I wasn't quite sure where to start. Stepping back, I thought there's this nice passage that comes later in the book. Um, one must grasp the dynamics of the oppression. As Bell writes in The Irish Troubles, A Generation of Violence, 1967 to 1992, and the rebels always know the three great things, what is wrong, what is wanted, and what must be done. Dworkin goes on, women have been half-hearted, divided by race and nation, but also lacking rigour. What is wrong has been defined as inequality. What is wanted has been defined as equality with men. What must be done is a short list that amounts to whatever they will allow. So I thought a way of thinking about this book as a whole is, um, is to think, okay, so in order for feminism to succeed, it has to, it has to know these three, these three things, right? It has to have answers to these three questions. So in Scapegoat, Dawkins can be understood as asking, what of this do women and don't women know and why? And she can be understood as considering how women's condition is and isn't like Jewish people's condition and, and perhaps vice versa in order to explore this question. Uh, so I so how I, I sort of approached the book was what are, what are some of the obstacles to working out answers to these questions? What's wrong, what's wanted and what must be done? Uh, and, and also what are the obstacles to, to doing it? Leah, yeah, I was. Uh, uh, this is on my mind a lot because I remember in the WDR, you um, you you made this nice point that how, how can I put it? Be, perhaps because uh, women are dispersed through men. You know, I think how you put yeah. it was there's no there's no SAR, right? Yeah. It's not perhaps it's not clear who the, who the target is, and I was thinking you're right, but it also seems so much harder than that, right? Like it seems. It seems that, you know, it's not just that women don't know or feminists don't know exactly what's wrong. I think many of us don't even know that something is wrong at all. Yeah, and I mean, that's, I think, the hardest part of coming to a feminist consciousness, right, is realizing that, I mean, it's not going to say it's like every single man. We know that's not true. But it's men as a class against women as yeah. a class. And it is vast numbers of them. Mm. It's not just a tiny little minority yeah. of them. I mean, the, the harms that are done to women are like, they're massive. I mean, it's just, it's on a global scale. And then the levels of sadism that women face at the hands of men. I mean, it's just, it's unbearable. And it's not just one little corner of the world. It's just like, oh, wow, look at this horrible place where men do these things to women. It's like, you could go through pretty much every single culture that exists right now. Um, and it's there, you know, you're going to find some absolutely hideous practices that men on the regular do to women. So, you know, what, and historically, so whether it's foot binding, whether it's clitoridectomy, whether it's, you know, in this country we have just what pornography has done to just basic sexuality um, is, is absolutely horrifying what's happening to teenage girls. Um, and then to adult women as well. I mean, just the numbers of women now who have been near strangled to death in just regular sexual encounters with men. That didn't happen when I was a teenager. Nobody thought that was sex. They turned that into sex. Mm, yeah. So every time you turn around, there's just like this whole other layer of just, just like levels of sadism that are like mind blowing. And this is what you have to come to terms with as a feminist is the amount of harm, first of all, that it, it really does approach more level. Yeah. You know, and if we're not gonna call it a war against women, I mean, fine. A lot of men sneer at us when we call it a war, but I would like to know what to call it then, because this is a mass scale. Yeah. It's around the world. It's been going on for thousands of years. I want a word for it, so if yeah. we're not going to call it war, all right, fine. I'll drop that one, but I want to know what then. Yeah. Um, 
So that's you know, like the, the, the big thing. But then it's not organized like other kinds of oppression because, you know, like you said, women are were separated from each other by class, by race, um, by culture, by all of it, by country. And so we don't see ourselves as a group particularly. We don't experience ourselves as a group. Right. We experience our identities as through the men that we're connected to, the men that we're born to, you know, the men that we're married off to. That's supposed to be our group, you know, our in-group, our tribe. Okay. Um, and it means that all the women are separated from each other, even though what we're going through is the same thing. Yeah. You know, battering is the same. Incest is the same. It has the same effect on us the world over. And, you know, those are the main tools is, you know, violence and especially sexual violence in, you know, whatever colorful way they decide <laughs> to put it on us. That's what, you know, that's what they're doing. And they do it because it's effective, because it's the most effective thing you can do is sexual violence. Like even Amnesty International says that, that rape is the worst kind of torture. It's the hardest one to heal from. And that's what men do on the regular to girls, to girls and women. It's just basically part of growing up, you know. Can so I, can I ask? There we are. And, and we're separated from each other so that we never come to class consciousness about it as as women fighting this. It's yeah. very, very hard to achieve that. And that's always, it's the hardest part of, of making a feminist movement is getting women to that place, to that consciousness. Can I ask something about the relation between the violence in particular and then maybe the slightly lower level kind of anti-woman sentiment or treatment in terms of I think Kate's question about what women know and where, whether they even know that they're oppressed in the same way that maybe Jewish people okay. always did, because it seemed like a lot of what you said in response was related to the ubiquity of violence against women. So I guess one question is, do people always know when they're subject to violence that that's wrong? It's mm. kind of plausible to me that they would, that they would always resent it in some way. But then there's this other stuff, right, which is just like, misogyny complementarity views right like you just mm -hmm. women have their special place and they're they're sort of inferior but but they have these unique qualities and they can get pregnant okay. and that sort of stuff and so i guess there's a harder question there even if people know that violence shouldn't be done to them in some instinctive way do they know <laughs> that they're not this kind of different special creature that has this place in the world and maybe that's a challenge that jewish people Again, I don't know, but maybe that's a just analogy where they weren't facing that kind of view about their place in the world, even if they were also facing violence. I don't know if I articulated that perfectly, but. Um, the no, I completely agree. I think that's one of the hardest parts about getting women to join into a feminist movement and to, to get feminist consciousness is that you can't. I just it's hard for me to imagine there's another group on the planet that endorses level of harm that doesn't have some sense of, yeah, yeah, you know, we are really being hurt here mm. where there's, you know, some solidarity amongst, you know, name your group, they know. And, and even if, you know, you personally are, for whatever reasons, you know, you have your own kind of barriers to that consciousness, it is very painful to come to consciousness that you've been hurt. Uh, you know, being hurt is humiliating and nobody wants to have to face it. But when you do finally face that in, in other situations and other groups, I, it's very easy to find the political theory and just the common knowledge that, yeah, you know, white people are horrible to black people. And, you know, and here's our history about that. And here's the songs we sing about it. And, you know, here's the church meetings you can go to about it. And here's the Harlem Renaissance. You can read the poetry about it. And, you know, here's this kind of resistance that we had to this treatment. And you'll find that in every group, you know, you find the culture of resistance that gave people the strength to overcome, you know, whatever horrors they were facing. And we don't have that as women because we live with men one by one by one. Um, well, yeah. Do you think we, what's going on in in those cultures of resistance is that they are um, that, that that other oppressed groups are 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 creating a new self con a new self conception? Yes, they are coming to think so. of themselves yes. as as people of whom this treatment is wrong. You know, Dworkin has this nice line that women are denied a self. So how could they even experience all of what is done to them as as wrong, as un, as as undeserved, as unjust? Yeah, and in my kind of reading and study about resistance movements, there's often this a whole generational period where what they do is they revive their culture first, and the people who are taking this on 
are very, very self-conscious about it. So I found that to be true in the Irish resistance to the British rule. I found it in the civil rights movement um, in America. Um, there's, it, it, I found it in the Baltic resistance to the Russian occupation. There's this, you know, this generation where they're like, we need to reclaim what it means to be an X. And that means that we have to relearn our language. Um, we have to learn our songs. We have to teach our children. Um, we're going to have festivals where we do theater and dance. Um, even things like sports become important. Yeah. Um, and I know in the Irish resistance, it was so interesting to read about that, especially because it was like, they're running around on a field, like playing, like, I am not a sports person. So it's like made no sense to me at all. But they, that ultimately was what that, those groups were, were ultimately what became the Irish Republican army. Mm -hmm. I mean, take it or leave it. You know, like I, we don't even have to get into whether they should have taken up violence or not. That was how they learned to do it. Yeah, because wow. if you think about what sports is, it's like, yeah, you're learning how to do military strategy. You're learning how to work as a team. You're learning how to listen to your captain. Um, all of that, you know, you're oh, learning how to bond with each other. And it literally, that was, became, you know, sort of step by step. That was what turned into the IRA, the original IRA, you know, and, yeah. and then they went on to fight um, to actually take up arms um, in various ways. But, you know, that was absolutely crucial to the entire movement that was the, the sort of renaissance of um, Irish culture. But the, you read the people who started the whole thing, like in the late 1800s, and, they're, and it's very, very clear in their minds, we have to redefine what it means to be either, you know, any of these things um, yeah. and take this back. We can't just be victims. We have to see the yeah. strength that we have, the beauty that we have, um, you know, that we are capable of doing this for ourselves. And when we get that done, we'll be ready to make a movement. And so there's always this generation that precedes it. And, you know, there certainly have been moments of real flowering of, of feminist consciousness and feminist culture like yeah. that. I feel like I got so lucky that I got to be part of that in the 1980s, you know, but even by the end of that decade, it was pretty well over. So for women, it never lasts because we're not born into it. Um, we have to find it later as, as, as older people, as, you know, I mean, I'm lucky because I was a teenager, really, but most don't get that lucky, you know, like you have to really stumble along until... <laughs> You, you know, you find some precious book and you're like, holy, I, I'm not the only one. Somebody yeah. else knows what I know. And then you get the language and somebody, you know, you get the framework. Um, you know, you actually can find words that describe what happened to you, which is just an amazing thing. Like you're not going crazy in your own head anymore. But all of that, we have to find one by one um, because that's how, that's just the basis of patriarchy. That's how it's organized. It's every man in every home with every woman, you know? So it's like, we're cut off from each other in that regard. And like, what do you do then? I don't, we're at a terrible disadvantage compared to other groups. And I'm not here saying, oh, women have it worse than, you know, it's just, it's different. It's differently organized. And this is one of the problems yeah. that, that we're up against as a, as a class, a caste, whatever you want to call it, as an oppressed group, is that we are separated from each other and we don't see it, it takes a lot to get us to see that we share a common condition. I mean, it, it also, <laughs> I know it all seems to come back to this topic today, but it seems like at least in the second wave, they could build a culture of, between feminists and start getting women's culture going. Whereas today, if we try to do that again, we would have the additional challenge of the gender identity movement, right? So it's almost yeah. impossible today to get real female separatism and start rebuilding women's culture if it's true that building and strengthening culture is necessary for resistance because you're right. always then going to have men there and women fighting for those men's inclusion. And if you cannot build women's culture with men's perspective in the room, then you've got to overcome that whole cultural yeah. challenge before you can even get started. So that's just something that the second wavers, I guess, didn't have to contend with, but we do. Like our names and phone numbers in the newspaper. Yeah. I can't imagine. It was yeah. like a completely different world. I'd be like, oh, yeah, we're having a meeting about blah, blah. We're going to have this group. And you would just put your name in the local paper. Yeah. Like, yeah. call me and we're going to do this. And, oh, yeah, we're meeting at the bookstore. And it was completely public. And I mean, it was like that. We just, I could go to any major city in the United States to go to the women's bookstore immediately find women to talk to, women to hang out with. You could find a place to live. You could find, I mean, you could just step into an entire world, complete. You would have everything you needed. You could get a woman plumber, like just anything you needed, a job. It would all be there on the bulletin board. 
and you could just walk right into it. And I, oh, I don't even know how to describe what we're missing now. It was an entirely different world. And now we can't even have a conference, you know, once a year without having screaming mobs banging on the windows like a zombie apocalypse. And we have to have armed guards to enter the building. I, I just, I don't, I don't even, like, how did it get this bad? I don't. Yeah, and it's you know women out there defending these guys too. I, that's the worst part to me is like just no solidarity at all with with women. Yeah, you'd rather be with these like absolutely terrifying, very violent men. Yeah, yeah. Uh, than us. I don't. It's well, this is a, this is a question that Dawkin asks, right? And I think she come and she comes back to it a few times. Like, can can women be lo- Can women be loyal to women? And in fact, she sort of reframes that towards the end. She has this nice line about, you know, can women betray betray men? You know, she, I guess she's recognizing that we we have been socialized to be to be loyal to men. So what it's going to take from us is, or what we experience at first as an act of betrayal. But on the other hand, she does describe these instances of women being loyal to women. So I, you know, what what accounts for that? I mean, she says right in the beginning that we are, that all women are going to have to do this. If we're going to get anywhere on this planet, Mm -hmm. we are going to have to break our loyalty to the men, to our men, to the men Mm -hmm. of our tribe. And that that is never going to be easy and they are going to hate us for it and we will be punished for it, but we are going to have to do it. And she recognizes this, that she herself, I mean, that's why, you know, she went to Israel and wrote this book is she realized that she was going to have to do that too, that. She still had tremendous love and loyalty to Jewish men. They were her men. Um, and she was going to have to face that down. Um, and her heart was broken when she went to Israel and saw how bad it was for women. Because she really, I don't think she expected it to be that bad. And then, of course, the pornography was completely horrifying. Um, so we have to do it. She's right. We are going to have to do it. Um, can we do it? I mean, some of us do. I, I feel like women are my people. I mean, that's really been true pretty much my whole life. I got lucky. I had a second wave mom. You know, she went to consciousness raising in 1972. And um, (laughs) the glorious result stands before you. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, she gave me feminist books and it was a really just she had such a value. She had really, really strong female friends herself. And she always, always valued those friends. And it was such a primary value in her life that you had to put women first, that you had to value your women friends, that you know, the men were always going to be second to that, no matter what, that uh, they just were never going to be the same as what you could get from from the women in your life, that there would be real love with women. And so she always, always prioritized her female friendships. And I, it was such a strong value for her. I never even thought about it. It just was, of course, true. It was obvious to me that it was, you know, women that fed her and that who she fed back and that the men were sort of around, you know, on the, the periphery doing what they did. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how to get other women to that place because it just, oh gosh. I mean, part of it is, is exactly what, I mean, Dworkin has this great quote where she says the, you know, the, the real problem with patriarchy is that it destroys precisely what feminism requires yeah. in women, which is unimpeachable bravery in confronting male power. So they break us so that we can't do it. And then we wonder why women can't do it. Well, everybody's got Stockholm syndrome. I mean, I know why they can't do it. They're bonded to their captors because, you know, like Dee Graham talks about in her book, Loving to Survive. It's just, it's societal Stockholm syndrome that none of us really have a way out. So, you know, maybe we're not locked in a house or locked in a room, but we are locked on a planet. There's nowhere to go. And so, you know, we do that bonding thing with the people who are our captors because there's not really a great way out. And I feel like the, the the first wave of feminists, they they gave us so many tools that have made my life possible. So I can vote, I can own a house, I can own my own property, I control my own money, I never had to get married, I didn't have to have children, I never did, and I don't have to. I was able to duck right under that because I didn't want them, so I didn't have to do it. Like, how many women in history can say, I didn't have to do that? Like, up until now, who was ever able to do that? I would have had to join a nunnery or something, I guess. I mean, so few women would have been able to get out of it. And I was able to just walk into my life and just make it mine. 
the way that men are able to. And all of that was because of the women who came mm-hmm. before me for a hundred years. And I'm aware of that pretty much every single day. I'm so grateful for what they gave me. But some of these tools, right? Like we need to keep pushing. They knocked a few bricks out for us and that was phenomenal. And they knew, the really radical ones in the first wave knew, we're doing this because rape, battering, incest, prostitution, that that's what comes next. But we can't do anything about that until we at least can be seen yeah. as you know, civic <laughs> citizens you know, in a democracy who can do something. We have to have these basic powers first. Women need some economic power, they need some political power, and then we can get this real stuff done. Yeah. And they did that for us. And then what? You know, it's like, ah, oh, there's like this brief burst in 1970s. And then it just like all, it all falls apart. It's like, what, we just got comfortable enough? Like we just managed to get enough that we're not completely under the heel all the time. And we're just going to what? It, and then we we described our oppression as liberation, you know? So it was no longer yeah, a problem that they needed to be what they solved. did. I know. I know. But this is like so now, know. great. We can all be sexual objects. Isn't yeah. that so much fun? Like that, yeah, sure, that's liberation. Yeah. But this is individual rationality, right? I mean, I guess this came up so many times in the book. Like there's a failure of collective action, there's a failure of women to act together. But but it's important to acknowledge that it it, it is individually rational for her to make that choice, right? Yeah. Because she gets one yeah, life. Is. And of course, when yeah. things are really bad, you've got the motivation to fight against them. But when they're sort of a bit bad and then you're getting to choose the path of least resistance and have some delicious meals and tolerate average sex, like it could be a lot worse, you know, so there's all these things. So I think maybe, I don't know if we take seriously enough that like every woman is doing nothing wrong and yet we aren't going to be able to get anywhere unless we can team up in this kind of really widespread solidarity between women way and act as a class against men as a class, that that is a quintessential problem of politics, right? Like in yeah. every domain. That's it. Um, that's it right there. Yep. No matter who you are, that's the problem. Yep. <laughs> and I don't have a solution. I mean, none, none of those groups do, right? But it's just like somehow acknowledging that like, of course, she's going to choose not to fight because she's got it good enough. So how can yeah. we possibly motivate her from a feminist perspective that it matters and that she's fighting for the the liberation of future women and that women did that for her, like you say. Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what narrative it would take to get women today to like want to take on those costs. Um, and they're huge costs. And especially once women have children, you know, you're really stuck. Most women, you can't. You can't. You're so financially dependent at that point. And it's just nothing but poverty. Yeah. You know, women just get ground down and down and down. And then fine, you know, you're a single mom and you're finally free. The kids are old enough to, you know, sort of launch into the world. And then you're staring at retirement. Yeah. And I mean, things in the United States, at least, are so bad. You know, we don't have pensions, really, unless you've had a really good job or, you know, married to somebody who had a really good job. A lot of us are just left with nothing. Yeah. And then you're staring at the next 20 years of your life going, well, now what? Um and so I get it. I understand why women, that you have to make the best decision you can just economically, especially when there's children involved, because it's just, you know, your life goes in a completely different direction then. And it's really hard. So I'm, I mean, at my age, I'm 57 and a lot of women my age, are just terrified yeah. about well, what, what's going to happen to us. I was like, I don't know. But don't you think we have children, so there's nobody to help us. And I like, I mean, I watched my mother be very sick before she died and it was awful. So uh, you know, getting old is not necessarily fun. And we all hope that we're just going to drop dead and that'll be the end of it. But, you know, a lot of times it's a decade or two of, you know, increasing stability and you need yeah. help and you need money and all. And it's just, we don't, I don't live in a, in a country where anybody helps. So, you know, we don't get any help from the government. So well, maybe I don't know. And so I totally get why women make the decisions they do. Yeah. It's terrifying out there. The world is very harsh and very cold. And you can be very hungry and nobody really cares. So it's, well, yeah, I, just, I get it. I'm just thinking maybe this points in, in, maybe what you just said points in the other direction because the government is the thing that's failing. But it seemed to me that like the individual rationality, the kind of s- structural features that you describe, they point in the direction of a state, solu- a top-down solution, right, which solves that structural problem 
um, in advance. And she did point to that. I don't have the page handy now. I think I put it in my notes that like, you know, she's sort of talking and toying with this idea throughout the book that like women need to rise up militaristically. But then there is this brief aside where it's mm -hmm. like, oh, or the government could introduce the changes um, and then there wouldn't need to be a war between men and women. Or maybe she was talking about Jews at the time. I can't remember. But it was like the, the government can actually introduce all that scaffolding so that the war is not necessary. And so then maybe it's like what we actually should be talking about is women's political parties or women lobbying every party to have a women's agenda and trying to do that in a way that it would solve the problem top down for a lot of people at once rather than this like get armed, get violent, retaliate. Right. Do you know what I mean? Um, I do. And I mean, this, there's so much that the government could do, like these kind of universal basic income things. I have not looked into that deeply, but it seems to me that solves a lot of problems. And yeah. if women weren't terrified of poverty, exactly. a lot of women would leave. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty much what happened, you know, through the 70s and the 80s is that a lot of, you know, women didn't have to be dependent on men anymore. And guess what? A lot of them left. Yeah. Like When you're actually handed a, a different opportunity, they leave. And then all that welfare reform happened in this country under the Clinton administration. And gosh, what do you know? A story after story of battered women who ended up back with their batterers because they literally couldn't survive, you know, with three kids without a male income adding to, and they just, there was nothing to do. There was nowhere to go and it was that or be homeless. So a lot of women ended up staying in really bad situations. So if we could get the state, you know, to kick in a little more yeah. uh, to help women, um, that, that could solve a lot of it. Because I think right now it's, it's just that level of desperation that keeps women... <laughs> Chloe, how did you how did you put it? You asked like, what would the narrative be that we could tell to get women to stop making these decisions? I think I can see I think I can see in Dworkin two two na two narratives. One is there, but for the grace of a man, go I. And the other one is, in fact, it's not it. It it looks rational, but it's not. You are you think you're giving up something for protection, and you're and you're not. You're you're giving up this. I mean, you made this point yesterday, Holly. You're giving up something in the end for for nothing. That person who's claiming to offer you protection will do nothing of the sort. Well, it's a protection racket. Is all it is. It's not real protection. Yeah. Because now you're stuck with this batterer. Yeah. So it's hard for protection. But I mean, she makes this point in right wing women that it's, you know, that the right offers you one man and maybe you can get a good deal, maybe you can't, but it's just one. Whereas, you know, without that, what are you left with in patriarchy? So women are making some actually quite rational decisions because if it's not one man, it's all men. Because then you're you're on the street and you're gonna have to deal with all of them you know, 10 of them a night to survive on the streets. So that's that's what we've got, as long as women are, you know, are faced with this kind of poverty. And then she also makes the point, I don't know if it was in this book or another one, but it's like, you know, that women are basically kept homeless so that we will be vulnerable to men. Like as a class, they know this, that as long as we're poor and desperate, there will always be at least some women that they can access sexually in whatever way they want. That, that we're just going to have to give into this. Uh, to survive. And so that's always why women are going to be homeless under patriarchy is to keep us all vulnerable. So some of us can be, you know, the the prize, you know, the wife, and then the others can be um, the sexual underclass, the sexually disappeared. Uh, and that's, you know, that's how men get what they want out of us. And whether or not they are all individually aware of this, who knows? I mean, probably not, but it's how the system works. So it's what we're stuck with. Yeah, I mean, there's like the narrower version of like women ex thinking that they exchange submission or obedience for protection. Um, and I can see the pushback to that, that that's not rational um, because they're actually not. Or some of them are gaining protection, but some of them are just gaining a domestic abuser or a rapist or whatever. Um, but then I think there's this broader point, like some a country like Australia, right, which does, I mean, again, it's going to depend what, what job you have and what class you're in, but maybe has substantially better financial protections um, for women or 
maybe women have more opportunities to walk away. I mean, I'm sure people would argue mm. with me about that. Um, but in general, I think, yeah, that's separate of an individual man, right? I think the thought is just like, um, things are not so bad for women. <laughs> like I, the individual woman, even the one who chooses to remain single and childless could think, yeah, I mean, there's like this incidence of rape and this incidence of domestic violence. And okay, occasionally you hear a man lights his whole family on fire and things are they're kind of bad, but they're not bad enough for me to sacrifice my lifestyle and take to the streets. And that's something slightly different from the, the individual rationality of accepting the protection of a man because you don't yeah. mind trading that for obedience. So I don't know how to talk to her, the one that's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I listened to Christina Hoff Summers and Camille Palia this morning being like, give us the freedom to risk rape. They, they literally said that. They were like college campuses. The girls are being cosseted. They want to like paternalize them and keep them in to keep them safe. And that one of them literally said, give us the freedom to risk rape because we want the same liberation as men. And I don't mean to get into the politics of like paternalistic treatment of women versus freedom, but it's like, why did they assume the rape environment is fixed and women should just have the freedom to like run those risks in it? Sorry, I know I'm all over yeah. the place, but it's just. Um, That's nuts. It's why are they holding that as fixed? Yeah. That's just unbelievable. Yeah. But may, but I can sort of see that a woman might think like, okay, these are the risks. They're not so high that I that my freedom is real. It's not Afghanistan, yeah. right? So it's yeah, not right, my freedom. Right. So, okay, okay, I'll take my chances and I'll just try yeah. and have the best life I can with those parameters. I think I think Dawkins trying to do a couple of things in all of her work. I think one is re-describe all the stuff that we think of as the not so bad stuff yeah. as really bad. Like this is what intercourse I think is is doing right it's like no it's not like all the really bad stuff is over there it's like you know really physically brutal rape like it's it's, it's way closer to home than that yeah um so she, i guess so she wants to re-describe that so women start to experience that with some resentment and i suppose the other thing is this is where the loyalty comes in right because isn't she it is is part of what she's saying you know you you women who, for whom it's not so bad, you're, you're, it, it can only be not so bad for you because there are other women for whom it is so bad. Good. Yeah. So once you're loyal to them, can, can we bear that any longer? Yeah, good. No, that's, that's helpful. And that's actually, that provides and that gives a narrative, right? I mean, I think you could really argue that forcefully that yeah. the women who, for whom it's not so bad are like relying on the degradation of other women um, in order to have their position. And that could yeah. be quite a strong motivator for a class politics. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, sorry. I'm making notes. Do you think, sometimes I think there is like, <laughs> deep within us we do feel loyal, loyal to women because we seem to feel like, you know, even those of us who don't identify as feminists, we seem to feel betrayed sometimes by women in a way that we can't quite feel betrayed by men. So I wonder if there is a feeling there to be ex exploited, perhaps exploited is the wrong term, um, to be tapped into. I mean, I think there's probably like on a scale of one to ten, there's probably like, you know, the ones who have like no loyalty to women at all and laugh at misogynist jokes and, you know, think it's totally fine that their boyfriend looks at pornography or whatever like you've got the ones right and then or you know encourage their daughters to be anorexic or just like the horrible things that you hear about right and then you've got women like me and you over here at number 10 where it's like i would do anything for women as a class like i've dedicated my life to this struggle women are my people the center of my life is always women no matter what and i just i'm not budging from this so that's like the tabs but then in the middle, you know, you're going to have this range, right, of women who feel some of it, not all of it. They have mm -hmm. some analysis, not a lot, maybe a little more, but they're not going to, it's not going to affect their personal lives. And then, you know, you're always going to have people who just have that, that, that edge where they feel the injustice of it. You know, whether or not they have a full analysis, that they just know it's wrong mm -hmm. and they can't stand it, you know, and those are always the people I want to reach. 
because I feel like I can talk to them. <laughs> some of the others, maybe not so much, but some of them, it's like, you know, like there was this, uh, this stupid story about this guy who helped build my house. And he was just one of these guys, like he could not stand men being violent to women or anybody hurting animals. And like, if he saw anybody abusing a dog, he would just be like, that's it. You got two choices. You're going to hand me that dog and I'm going to give you a hundred dollars and you're not ever going to think about it again. Or you're going to hand me that dog because I beat you up. So it's one or the other. This dog is not staying with you. You're not a good person to have this dog and you don't hit dogs. And he would mean it, you know, and he would get abused dogs away from people. And the same thing, like if he ever saw men being horrible to women, always thought and, uh, yeah. 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 No, there's people like that in the world. What explains you know, those people? Women, just, yeah, they true. stand it and it's, you know, them, you give them a political consciousness and now you have a leader. You know, now you've got somebody who is is really motivated because they're motivated in their soul. You know, like this, their personality is just like the injustice sets them on fire and they just need to find the right movement, you know, like the right analysis. And then some, some hope that, you know, something's going to change. It's like you see a movement that's actually starting to get something done, that that's when people join, you know. And so you hand them that, like, okay, this we've got this plan. Mm. We've, we've got a way to get this done, yeah. so now we just need you to join us. And then they'll join. Can I ask a sort of new topic question, or at least slightly new topic? Um, there was this one bit, I think it's in the hate literature pornography chapter, that I was just like... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if antagonized by is the right word, but maybe just like confused and then it really pushed on the, the Jew slash woman analogy for me. Um, so it's on page 148. She says of Hitler, asked if it was necessary to eliminate the Jews. Hitler said, we should have then to invent him. It is essential to have a tangible enemy, not merely an abstract one. And I thought this was really interesting because it suggested that it's not so much about the Jews per se, right? That there's some scientific belief in inferiority or whatever. It's just this need to have an enemy or another that you can do self aggrandizement against. And maybe then I just got confused. Like, are we supposed to be thinking the same thing about men? And does Dworkin think the same thing about men? Like it's not so much anything about women or it's not the religious tradition of Eve's fall from grace in the Garden of Eden, or it's not something about women's inferiority and that they deserve this treatment from men, or men have a natural right. It's just that men need another, like social hierarchies prop themselves up on others. And then then the disanalogy gets complicated because unless you believe in third sexes, which of course some postmodernists do today, but if you're sensible, there is no other other when it comes to sex, right? So now men are what, like incidentally treating women badly or being violent to women, but it's not because they're women, it's just because they're the only other option for the enemy. But whereas in racial terms, the Jews could presumably then have like displaced the hatred onto some other group and been like, no, Nazis should hate them, not us, because you just need someone. And I guess this speaks to the question of the whole book, right? Why is it called Scapegoat? Why does she see women mm. and Jews as why is scapegoat the right concept here? I just, I found all that a bit, like I just, I don't really know what to think about it by the time I got to the end of the book. Um, so yeah, do either of you have any thoughts about what was going on there? Well, it's pretty basic, at least in patriarchy for male socialization is, you know, they create this, this the category of the other, yeah. you know, that they have to have a, what's called a negative reference group. And the very first one is always girls. It's always women. And she talks about that in her book, Pornography, where she says, whatever she is, he is not. Yeah. Um, and that's like the first rule of patriarchy is that, you know, men, you know, are not this horrible thing called women, that they have to set up this other category that is the despised. Um, and this is why, for instance, boys do better in mixed sex education and girls do worse is because somebody has to take that role. And when it's girls and boys separate, um, the girls do great because they don't do that to each other. And the boys, half of them do bad because half the boys have to turn half the other, the other half of the boys into that negative reference group. So there's a whole chunk of boys that do way worse. 
because they are they become the despised other. Um, and you know, you can see this writ large across the world. So, and I don't know, like, is that a thing that's just like where does that come from? Why do men feel the need to do that? I don't, it's just it's beyond me. We we know that girls don't really do this, that yeah, you know, girls do way better when they're allowed to communicate and they're allowed to collaborate. Like that's really, really basic to girls' psychology. So why? Why are men like this? Like right. can we fix it? Like what? Can they fix it? Can anybody fix it? Is this just, I don't know. But uh, anyway, so yeah. And so I think that's part of the question in scapegoat is like, look, if we're going to seriously suggest that women are going to be a political class enough that they might even have their own country, is it possible to have a state without it being against another? Mm-hmm. And do we have to have this horrible psychology then? And of course, she's hoping not, but that is really the open question. Is it, is it possible to have a state that doesn't do that because that's what nationalism is really. So can we do this as women and not do it without that kind of dehumanization? And then of course, human rights abuses that follow from it. So. Yeah, that was really helpful because I think you suggested that it, that it is now socialization and though. And holy, because yeah. I, I want it to be, I mean, yeah. we're kind of hopeless if it's not. Yeah. If men are just biologically this way, we're, there's no, we're not getting out of this alive. Yeah, I don't. I don't go in for that. That that we biologically need an other. Yeah, and I mean there have been you know matriarchal cultures. There have been matrilineal cultures that didn't do these things. There have been peaceful cultures where there was no war. The problem is, of course, if you're the peaceful culture and the war culture comes, you either get destroyed or you learn to fight. Yeah. So either way, you're not a peaceful culture anymore, and this is why the whole world is now not a peaceful culture. Um, once somebody has this idea and starts doing this, it's, unless they're very bad at it, um, it's going to take over. So we, we don't have much left. We just have little glimmers now of, of the matriarchal cultures, but they, they are fascinating, you know, to, to see how, how things might be done. And so I know it's weird, you know, being a radical feminist, but sometimes I feel like I have more hope for men than they have for themselves. Like, I don't really want them to be monsters. I'd much prefer if this was just their socialization and actually they could get over it and not do this anymore. Mm-hmm. And they're the ones out there going, no, we are violent rapists by nature and you have to civilize us. Otherwise this is where we end. It's like, why do you want to believe that about yourselves? And why am I stuck here arguing for your humanity? I don't particularly see evidence of your humanity. I'm just going to keep believing because we kind of have to really. Yeah. Is it, I think it's either that we're going to kill them all, and I don't see us doing that is yeah. the problem. Plus, yeah. I mean, what would that turn us into? But, I mean, really, we think women are going to create that much violence against men? We we never are violent. When are we ever violent to men? When? I mean, it's just, women have to be really mentally ill, essentially, to, to do that kind of, I mean, women don't go out and annihilate their families. Like, we, we just, it's not a thing. We know this about women. So why do we think women would rise up and take up arms against, like, it doesn't make it, I can't see it happening. Like, I just don't see where, how we would get women to a point where enough of them would do that to make it dead. And if they did, we could, if we had that many in number, we could just do it nonviolently. So I just feel like that's kind of off the table. But. Mm. I feel like you were trying to say something about men. Me? Me? Yeah. No, I think I lost my train of I lost my train of thought because I started thinking there about the analogy. Like, is I mean, because Daw- I mean, it, it was, in the preface, I think Dawkins says, you know, she's come to think that women have to like at least seriously entertain being violent, or that we have to learn violence at least as self defense. So I thought the book was going to be a bolder statement about how we need to practice violence, and then actually she turns out to be quite and. Um, um, yeah. And if, and I think rightly so about this. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Leah, just as you were talking then, I was thinking, oh, just, can we bring the analogy back here? Because I guess it's like part of what's um, informing her ambivalence, the the way that the violence has been used, um, like by by the Israeli by the Israeli army. I yeah, I I mean, I I found all of that really really interesting. I'm not. Sh- not sure what to take I mean I'm not sure what to take from that um I mean she she seems to have this anxiety right that like 
okay, the the Jews got their own got their own state and then somehow but but look at what they then became or something like so is there any way and Leah this is what you just said basically is there any mm. way that women could do that and then not sort of take on those um qualities uh, and then I was thinking well there's like two ways that people end up having a homeland right like they they colonize or they're refugees <laughs> and then they're sort of like welcomed in in large numbers and so I was trying to think like there is this alternative pathway like the the Maldives or Tuvalu uh, at threat from climate extinction right. and hopefully other nearby countries will take them in as peoples in large numbers. Maybe they get dispersed somewhat throughout the region, but it might be right that New Zealand takes in enough Maldivians that there's like, a, whatever that's called, like regions that have like a, a culture still, um, and so again, it's not like necessarily to get a homeland, women would have to rise up militaristically and like kill loads of men and take over, you know, become colonizers. And that's just like, there are alternative parts. You can start a women's land and then gradually expand it as a city um, within a, a friendly feminist country. Um, so that, that would be a way, I think, you thinking utopianly that, that you could end up with something like a women's country or a women's homeland without having to take on any of those traits of like becoming violent or oppressing some other or really demonizing right. men in the way that you would need to to justify getting a homeland in the way that the Jews ended up getting one, right? Because then you would become man-hating or man-oppressing just to get enough political momentum up to get other states to take it seriously, right? But so maybe this thing of like, doing it politically, doing it as refugees, doing it via ever-expanded women's land, somehow solving the trans problem along the way so that there were no men there. <laughs> Maybe that's the sort of like feasible way to imagine something happening and then at least trying to change things enough from there. Because then I don't know if we end up in the sort of, you know, um, sci-fi, like there's just separatist, <laughs> like men have their countries and women have theirs and we just have to learn how to defend the borders. Or if it's like, then what, we get strong enough to reintegrate or we, we have our own culture enough to resist theirs? Like, I'm not sure what happens after. Right, what happens next? Yeah. We need the whole planet to come around. Yeah. Like, it's not actually that I want this beautiful, perfect, safe, world where I can just create and not worry about rape anymore. Yeah. I don't want it to exist anymore. Yeah. I want the entire planet to get in on this plan. Yes. So even if we let's say somehow we got our own country, that would be really great. But there'd only be whatever, 50 million of us there. And then what? Exactly. Like the other 3 billion women on the planet, we're just going to let them stay in patriarchy. Yeah. No. Like, that's not what I'm after. I'm not after just a good life for me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then what? We still need the rest of the planet to get in on it. Yeah. And I just wonder, even if all the women came, then what happens? Like, can you can you yeah, get right? good international relations between the man countries and the women countries such that they could reintegrate? Could there be then a third type of mixed country and we would just see how that goes? Like, I just kind of wonder. I love it. What, what's, the, what, what's the vision from there? Um, oh, yeah, that's really good. Yeah. Did you ever read, it's a Sherry Tepper, she writes science fiction and what I guess they call it speculative fiction. Um, she had this book, this was, I think this was her first book, and it was called The Gate to Women's Country. And so that's what the plot was, that the women all lived inside these big cities and the men all lived outside. And then there was like one day a year or something where there was mixing and that's where babies came from. Um, and then the men were always out, they were fighting war against like the all the, the different cities, it was like city states. And so there was always these wars going on where the men would fight each other. And the women basically thought it was stupid, but they lived in their cities and then they had, you know, like their own food and stuff. Um, I don't know if I should tell you the punchline because you might read it. But it's, <laughs> it was utterly, it was a fascinating book and I did not see the twist at the end coming. Oh, at, okay. But it was very well done. And then the opposite book of that is, of course, The Wanderground, which was a very a radical feminist kind of lesbian separatist version, except it was the opposite, because in that book, the men were stuck living in the cities 
and the women had escaped to the country. And there was this magical event, this mystical thing had happened called the revolt of the earth. And the uh, all the animals and all the mach- the animals stopped listening to men and they wouldn't obey their commands. And none of the machines would work outside the cities. So inside the cities, like men still had this terrible power and they could make mach- machines would still work. But the moment that they left and got a few miles outside, sort of their sphere of influence, the machines just stopped working and none of the animals cared what men said. So women could escape out. Yeah. And so they had this, they this whole other world outside where they learned to fly and they have all these psychic abilities and they've got this whole culture and they're you know healing each other and all this. And they can bounce communication off the moon. So they're communicating with all the other women who have escaped all over the world. And they're trying to figure out like what to do. And But they have to keep a balance because if too many, they've realized if too many women leave, the whole system falls apart. So some of them have to go on to rotation back into the cities and endure sort of the horrors of the cities and then they can come back out again and be healed. Right. So it's rather fascinating, but it's exactly the opposite because yeah. in the Gates Women's Church, it's the women inside and the men are roaming around. Mm-hmm. And this one, it's the men are stuck in the cities and the women are all free outside. Um, so, I mean, women have, you know, thought about these ideas yeah. over time, but I took, this is fascinating. Like, okay, what then? Yeah. Like, let's say we did get this country and we were able to do it in a way that didn't wreck our humanity. Um, okay. So now we've got 50 million women living in a <laughs> some kind of paradise, but you're right. That doesn't actually change the real problem, which is the other three four billion men yeah. who are still yeah. doing these terrible things. Yeah. I don't know. Is it actually a, a, is it a feasible strategy? But then even if we succeeded, what then? Because it still doesn't answer the problem of the fact that four-year-olds are being raped tonight by their fathers, you know, and women are being beaten. Like that was the entire problem. So yeah. what then? But no, no strategy that will get us to liberation is going to seem well, from here, like from the vantage point of the present, is going to seem feasible, right? Right. So <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm inclined to think let's just but let's forget that as a criteria as a criterion. Yeah. You know, let's or like dream. aspire in the utopian direction. Yeah. I mean, one thing Kate and I were talking about yesterday was how shit. Like, sorry, that we should spread the message more when we do this utopian thinking that it is going to be like shit and unpleasant in the beginning (laughs) and i say that because of talking to women about women's lands um in the second wave that like it sounds like it was the the militant feminists and then because of course it provided a safe haven for women who were experiencing the the worst of male violence and and deprivation at the margins of society you had all these extremely damaged women coming to seek mm-hmm. refuge, but then, of course, causing oh, yeah. catastrophic problems. Oh, yeah. And so I think that this oh, yeah. idea that there's, like, this idyllic women-only mm-hmm. place where everyone, like, gets yeah. along and there's no violence, and it's, like, that's that's really unrealistic, right? Like, what it's going to be like is actually what feminism is often like, which is, like, women being horrific to each other in a very unidyllic way maybe for quite a long time and maybe for some people that are damaged enough it would be it would be not within their lifetime right it would be a sort of yeah. ongoing project yeah. of re-socializing new people from birth so i just sort of think that's interesting too because i i find in the sci-fi it's very often like oh just this like wonderful place where women are great to each other but it's like we're in a tra- we have to transition and the transition period yeah, yeah. <laughs> um yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I really, I, I really believed in the women's land thing, and it was, it was the life I wanted, and it, you know, it was like going to Atlantis or something. Like, you know, someday <laughs> I'll find it, kind of, you know. And I had the different magazine subscriptions back then. We had paper magazines that you know, would come in the little newsletters that came in the mail. But, um, and it was exactly that. That even if the women who founded it had a great vision, who arrived there and stayed there would often be so dysfunctional that everybody else left yes. because. They were violent alcoholics and drug addicts and had all kinds of, you know, mental illnesses that nobody wanted to deal with. And it, everybody just got driven right off. So um, it, it didn't work as a model. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that is maybe this is like overstepping outside the lines of feminism. But I find that is often the problem with inclusivity per se. Right. It's just like this value that gets so much weight and, yeah. I, and I think feminists have put a lot of weight on it too right it's like all sure. women and of course we want to stand for all women but being realistic about what it's like when you have that completely open door policy <laughs> the kinds of personalities that you might end up then 
being committed by principle to, to dealing with um, or trying to do political work alongside. I guess Chesler was open about that in a way that I haven't yeah, seen yeah, any yeah. other feminist yeah. right? Because she says the fucking yeah. lunatics, psychopaths. <laughs> like, yeah. It's like she's yeah, just yeah. like, yeah, it is. Um, We've got psychopaths. There's no question. <laughs> yeah. Do, do I, mean, I can remember some, at some point in my late 30s coming to the realization that I was never again going to join a group that didn't have a process in place to remove people who were damaged, destructive, abusive, right. whatever. If there was not already a way to get rid of them, I wasn't joining because yeah. we've been doing it too many times. And it's, yeah, it's like there's a reason your heart is inside your ribcage. It needs a little protection. <laughs> have to have a boundary here a little bit, you know, a little boundary. Yeah. Um, I wonder if it's related. Dawkins has the, you know, where she says, like she asks, can women be loyal to women? And she says, like including the bad one. She doesn't say bad, I can't, but that's what she means. In, or including the ones who've done horrific things. Mm -hmm. You know, and she's sort of suggesting this will be the, the test of us a little bit, a little bit. I mean, I guess we can stand for all women as feminists. Yeah. We can, those are our people. Yeah. But we cannot want to be in the room with and work together <laughs> with some of those women because they are intolerable. Um, and that's fine. And that's That's fine. totally fine. To but I, fine. whoever she is, it doesn't matter. I don't want her raped. I don't want her to live in yeah, poverty. Exactly. I don't want her to be in prostitution. Yeah. You know, I don't want her to fear for her life ever. Yeah. Like all you will fight for human rights. Yeah. Every last person on the planet deserves basic human rights. Nobody deserves any of that. And I will fight forever yeah. to the end of my day. You know, all of that is what I want. You, but you're right. She's not coming to my birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm fine. laughs> Not. <laughs> Leo, do you think your do you think your sense of um, sometimes I, uh, I think we uh, we think that we have to have an analysis of what's going on first, and then we have to start in in um, envisaging the future. And sometimes I think it could could it be the reverse. Like I wonder if is your sense of what's going of the wrong in the present do you think it's partly informed by having read this literature about the future you know like sometimes when you can see things could be otherwise then you can look at the present and be like this is not satisfactory in light of the future um i think that that kind of literature can be can provide exactly that it can provide a dream you know there's a way to to actually just like you say a future where things are different and I'm going to um, throw in something else here, which I think is important. The That first wave of feminists here in the United States, a lot of it started in upstate New York, in a rural area of New York. And there's actually a reason for that. And the reason is that the um, women of European backgrounds who were living there befriended a lot of the indigenous women who lived there. And those tribes in that area, of the, the woodland tribes in the United States, were very matrilinear. And some of them were, you know, honest to God, like gynocentric cultures that were rape-free cultures. And so their vision of the more egalitarian society that they were trying to bring forth in America uh, was absolutely informed by their direct experience of a completely different way of life. And Matilda Jocelyn Gage is the one who's the most, probably the most forgotten and the most radical of the American suffragists. And she was actually adopted into the Seneca tribe and was given the name, She Who Holds Up the Sky, which is really beautiful. Um, but they were friends with these women and they talk about how you could go there and walk around in the middle of the night at two in the morning and have, I mean, they have some way of putting it like, uh, the no, you would feel no threat to your person, i.e. no man was gonna rape you. Um, because it, there was just, it was not a concept in that culture and you could go to the decision-making councils and there would be men and women both just sitting there talking about, all right, well, this is, we got to make a decision and they'd go around the circle and everybody would talk and women's voices were very much expected to be present and they, you know, had a, a strong voice in the community, just like the men did. Um, and so they didn't make up this like completely utopian, uh, you know, just like fantasy out of nowhere, they actually saw a different way of life. Mm -hmm. And that was a great deal of what inspired, you know, their ability to be long-term, you know, their whole lives, some of these women were feminists. They never even saw women get the vote, but they kept fighting for it. Uh, and that was one of the things that, that actually was the inspiration for it was the indigenous women of this continent. And so that's just like this, this debt, you know, that I feel like radical feminists owe to those women 
um, that doesn't really get talked about too much. It's sort of, you know, hidden in the history. But there's a really good book called Sisters in Spirit. And that's about exactly that. So I always try to remember to like just to mention that book and that there's um, history there that's actually really sort of rich and deep and and goes to just something that's so core about what we're struggling against. Um, and it doesn't have to be this way. And that women saw that, you know, and realized, okay, well, it's, we're not just dreaming. Like we, we can have a better, a better world, a better way. We're getting to about an hour. So uh, if it's okay with you guys, I think I'm just going to make one little disclaimer comment and then we'll wrap up. The disclaimer comment, feel free to disagree with me, is that, because uh, I think if people watch this video or watch the WDI, they might think this book is quite a lot about feminism <laughs> and it's quite a long book to read. And we, we discovered in the reading that this book is mostly like a very long, very dense history of violence against Jewish people. And it has some kind of asides about women. So she's certainly trying to like keep both women and Jews in mind. But it is like, I reckon 95% a book about Jewish history and then like 5% some sort of reflections on women. So just in case people feel like they're expecting something and then like order the book and then read the book, just so you know sort of what, what the book kind of actually contains. And then I think both of these two discussions, we're sort of pulling out what we're most interested in, like as Radkin. Is that fair? Yeah. 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 And like all of Dworkin's work, it's very complete. I mean, she's done so much research. There's yeah. just so much history about the entire world, you know, like packed into this book. And also there's an awful lot of rape. I mean, you yeah. just have to know that if you pick up work and that there's going to be some real trauma, you're going to feel shaken a lot. It, they're never easy reads. Um, it's always worth it, but just, okay, trigger warning. Yeah, it's it's rough material. It's rough going. Yeah. Good. Kate, did you want to add anything else? Uh, no, I don't think so. Amazing. Uh, Leah, thank you so much for making the time. To oh, you're, you're so welcome. Anytime. Yeah. This was so much Thanks, fun. Yes. We used to talk like this all the time. <laughs> I so miss having radical feminist friends. Oh. We need to talk more. Yeah, uh, no, this is great. I hope you mean that because we'll probably pester you again. <laughs> We'd love we to be your friends. Yeah. You can come to my birthday party, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Don't bring her, but you can come to my birthday party. <laughs> I'll keep checking the mail. Very good, very good. Awesome. Thanks so much. Bye. Okay, bye.